Can you hear me now? Oops. Let's try that again. Happy New Year. There you go. So this is our first Sunday of our liturgical year in which we prepare ourselves today and the next three Sundays for the coming of Christmas and launch into this new year with this expectation of what God is doing in our lives and in our world. This morning, if you would grab a couple things out of your bulletin, your take-home work, uh, Mark chapter 11 is our take-home work this week. We're almost through the Gospel of Mark as we've been doing this as a congregation together. Also, many have made mention about the a women's building and the mule on the front of our Garden of Gratitude. Coming off of this week of Thanksgiving, I'm sure you're overwhelming and overflowing with gratitude and all the things that you have to be grateful about. What we're now doing is adding the canopy so that it looks like a monkey pod tree, and we would like your hands to go on that wall with paint. And if you would write down, there's a little note card next to it, about what you're thankful for this year, and we're going to keep adding to our gratitude garden. Our keiki from the preschool have done it, the kapuna from the adult take care have done it, the staff have done it, and now it's the congregation's turn to fill it out. And so immediately after worship, I know that you're going to run as fast as you can over there, put your hands on the wall, and then go get coffee and cake and celebrate the first Sunday of the year. Also in the bulletin, you'll see some staff news. We have some exciting news. Uh, Robertson Frederick, who many of you know, has been here on staff for 11 years, has been promoted to a new position here on staff entitled the Facilities Operations Manager, which he's going to oversee all of our facilities and run uh, the primary staff of our buildings and grounds. We're excited to see him rise to the occasion and what he's going to do. And so congratulations, Robinson. You're hiding back there. Stay. I don't know if anybody can see you. And also, in your bulletin, you'll see a small sheet about Alice Tom. Alice is a uh, member of our church who we're bringing onto staff to take a new title, entitled Director, Director of Congregational Care. And she's going to be in charge of creating a system to ensure that every one of you are cared for deeply within our congregation. So her first day is this Tuesday uh, as she comes back to town from her Thanksgiving travels. And I am thrilled and excited to have her on staff to ensure that Pastor Brandon, myself, Pastor George, and Bill Crockett, our chaplain, can make sure that we care for our congregation deeply, but also allow space to allow you all to care for each other. And so good news happening around our church together. And with that, let us pray as we begin our sermon time this morning. Our God, it is a new year in which we are invited into this journey of faith. We start in the season of waiting and longing, of hoping, in this belief that, God, you show up at the right moment. In this season of Advent, would you show up and surprise us anew? Help take this ancient story and let it sink into us and inspire us. But most of all, in this moment, would you come and fill us with your presence? For the name of Jesus, our Christ, that we pray. Amen. It's not very often in our world that we're surprised in a good way, but in the last few weeks, there's been a video that's gone viral of a young daughter and son-in-law that wanted to surprise her parents with the news that they were expecting. So they sat the mom and dad at a table and put big earphones on and pumped really loud music into the earphones so that they couldn't understand what they were saying, and they were supposed to read the lips of their children to discern the message they had. Well, immediately the mom got it that fast. But the dad, well, he was a little slow. And so they begin to repeat over and over again the same phrase, and he begins by understanding that they're saying, you are. And so it begins this series of guesses. You are going to the beach. You are going to behave. You are a great father. Grandfather. You're a grandfather. You're going to be a grandfather. You're going to be a grand... I'm going to be a grandfather? I'm going to be a grandfather. He jumps up and starts cheering and grabbing his daughter and celebrating with her this great news of this great surprise. I'm going to be a grandfather. 
You see, this season of Advent is this season in which we wait for a surprise. We wait in this belief that Christmas has good news for us even still today. And so over these next four weeks, we're going to look at four surprise visits from angels in the Gospel of Luke, telling the story of Advent and Christmas, to see if we can be surprised again about our sacred story. I do this for a living. This is one of the greatest times all year long. And yet what I find is so often the, the majesty, the allness, the amazement of this season is surpassed by the presence we shop for, the gatherings of friends and family. That maybe this year we can be surprised together again what God would like to do in us. And what does this message have to say in 2015? But today we turn to the first surprise in Luke's gospel to a priest. A priest who's doing his deal as a priestly duty, being in the temple, burning incense, and praying when he gets the surprise of a lifetime. The words that are used in our scriptures to describe Zechariah are interesting. Righteous blameless, that he and his little Elizabeth, his wife, are observers of the Lord's commandments and regulations. These are good church folk. These are people that love their God and have spent their lives devoted to doing what God has called them to do. And yet, they live with shame in their own world. In the ancient world, it was believed if you couldn't conceive a child that God was punishing you. And unfortunately, it was always the women's fault which now with science we know differently. But it was this belief that there was something wrong with them and God was punishing them and cursing them by not having children. And so I imagine this priest of God, this one who loved God with his whole heart, mind, body, and soul and learned how to love others, would take the kids to bless them. And surely there was a pang in his own heart that it was never his child. Or maybe as he opened up his scriptures and read about Sarah and Rebecca, as he read about these women that were barren in the scriptures, how often did he pray, oh God, would you hear my prayer and allow my wife to bear a child? And one year turned into a second year and a third year. And the hope surely was there each year. But as a decade went by, that hope diminished. And then now as two decades went by, the hope was extinguished. And so he continued to do what he was supposed to do, all the while realizing he was missing something that he longed for, along with his wife, Elizabeth. Until, until an angel shows up and has the great phrase of all angels in our scriptures, don't. Be afraid. Don't be afraid. Your wife, who's well on in age, is going to bear a child. Your wife, who you thought could never get pregnant, your hope is now realized and the reality that she's going to be with child. And this isn't just any child. This is the child who will prepare the way for the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That all this studying he's done of whenever God shows up to barren women, the world changes with their sons. The good news is for him too. And yet he struggles with it, doesn't it? How can this be? I'm an old man and my wife is well on in her age. But you see, the surprise for Zechariah isn't just this child, but the surprise is hope. Hope. And in the midst of living, he had given up hope of what God could do in his life. And yet, in an angelic encounter, hope is reborn. And not instantaneously, is it? It takes about 40 weeks for that hope to come to bear. He leaves that space mute, unable to speak. And that's the way that he has to now live until the day that the child is born. 
And when that baby is born, he gets a tablet, and I'm sure he's rejoicing quietly. And he writes down, his name will be John. And immediately he speaks. He doesn't just speak, he prophesies about his son and what he's going to do in this world in preparing this way and hope extends out of him. Hope is a powerful image. I don't think it's a mistake that the first Sunday of our year, we gather around this candle that has been lit in this belief that we have hope. Whether it's a diagnosis that we've been given, we have hope. Whether it's estrangement in a relationship, we have hope. Hope. Whether it's the reality that when we look in the mirror and don't like what we see, we have hope. This faith of ours is built on the foundation of hope. This idea that God is never finished with this world, as we discovered last week on Christ the King Sunday, even death isn't the end. Instead, the end is always life. Hope. Hope is a powerful tool in the arsenal of those that follow the way we call the way of Jesus. For no matter how strongly we feel like it's not possible, we hang on to a glimmer of hope. No matter how bad the world seems to be right now, we hang on to the glimmer of hope. No matter how estranged we may feel from our God, we hold on to an ounce of hope and the belief that God isn't finished yet. And when we hold on to hope, it allows us to begin to rise, to begin to believe, to begin to trust that even though it doesn't make sense in the moment, it will someday. And that's enough for us today. There's a story of a fisherman off the coast of Mexico, who went out to go fishing. He had gone out and had a haul of a lifetime, and he came back to shore in his 25-foot-long boat and hired a man for two days to go out and fish some more. As they were out, they had a radio that they heard the weather report was turning and that the winds were going to pick up, and all small crafts should go back to shore but the fishing was too good to stop. And so they kept on fishing until suddenly a gust of wind in the front came through and began to push that boat further and further out to sea. And through the night they held on in the belief that if they just made it through the storm, they could make it back to shore. But the next day at the dawn of a new day, the storm had subsided, but they were further out to sea than they had expected. And so they began to motor back to shore. And as they motored, they thought they could make it maybe 13, 15 miles offshore when suddenly their engine died. He pulled out the radio and said, we're in trouble, our engine has died, please send help. And the person on the other line said, drop your anchor, we'll come find you. Silence. And suddenly this captain said, we don't have an anchor. It would take up too much space. And so I left it at the beach. They were drifting out at sea, and they waited with hope that a search plane would come over them or a ship would find them. And one day turned into two days, which turned into three days, which turned into a week, and then two weeks and in three weeks. They had thrown all their fish overboard and everything that they had to try to keep the boat afloat. And suddenly they started catching birds that would land on the boat or fish that would swim close by to try to survive. And one day, the hired hand went crazy and refused to eat and suddenly passed away. And for six days, the captain kept him in the stern of the boat for company until he realized that his decomposing body was too much to bear, and he threw him overboard. 
For weeks, he floated in the great Pacific Ocean. Until one day, he thought he was hallucinating in Saul and Atoll and coconut trees. He sat on the front of the boat, trying to figure out if it was real or just another hallucination, when suddenly in the shallows he could look down and see that he was hitting ground. And he jumped out of the boat and climbed onto the beach and laid there and realized that he had found earth again. So he began to explore this island very slowly and suddenly saw a red shirt blowing in the breeze in the distance. And he went to find help. Well, this young man, 36 years old, was out at sea for 438 days. 14 months drifting in the expanse of the sea. When asked, how did you survive? He said he had always hoped he would be found. And the hope carried him through. Hope. It's a powerful tool in the lives of all of us. I was sharing this story with Marion Lyman Mercero a few weeks ago, and she began to share her story of the Hokulea, especially when it capsized in the late 70s and then her voyage later. And she wrote a poem for us today that I'd like to share with you. She's a great poet, and we have continued to use her poems throughout this last year and a half. But the poem has a profound title, Hope. May these words inspire when we're adrift in the sea of life, longing for something to give us a course, a reason to believe, a reason to hope. And so hear these words called hope. When the evening sky becomes a blanket of black, and clouds block out all light, when no vague translucence of moon shines through, gone is the spectacle of constellations that marched across an ornate sky, gone is the steady press of wind on sails that pushed bow through warm wind and sea. Here icy unruly swells bully the ship, thrash and threaten her without reprieve. Here the navigator stands a vigilant watch, searches a dismal sky for a mere glimmer of light. Now a hopeful search frustrates the patient seeker. Now only stubborn darkness remains. But just before a graying dawn washes over the confused sea, where no clue can be found, the dark opens above. A star breaks clear between clouds and reveals the true course. A moment of grace is given. May the guiding star of hope be your surprise this Advent season. May it be so. Amen.